All right. Sounds good. Hey, everybody. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Matt Nelson and myself, Matt Miner in the morning, our session two of uh, some agronomy updates for August. Uh, thanks for joining us again. Uh, appreciate your time. Uh, we're going to we're going to not waste time. We're going to get going here. So um, just some some maybe some housekeeping deals uh, that we can talk about here. So if you would just put yourself on mute. We do have some opportunities for some interaction here when we have some questions coming up. And uh, we'll obviously take questions at the end. So if you would put yourself on mute, but if uh, by all means, if you have a question, take yourself off mute and go ahead and ask. Not a problem there. And give me just a second to make sure things are working. Here we go. Um, so some topics that Matt and I wanted to cover today on our session, uh, just some notes from the field. So Matt and I have been seeing a little bit of premature denting in corn. So Matt's going to cover that topic today. I'm going to cover uh, kind of the status and where we're at as far as corn rootworm issues and give you a little bit of a preview of what we've seen from uh, the SmartStacks Pro Camp, the new trait that's coming down the pipe. We're going to talk about SDS and soybeans, uh, something that's starting to creep up on us right now, especially in some higher stressed areas. And then uh, we're just going to end this thing with a, a recap of some of our high volume corn products and just give you some highlights from some of those things that we've uh, we've got in the pipe and and uh, that we're selling today. So, Matt, we'll go ahead and get started with you. Uh, let's talk about premature denting in corn. I'd rather we didn't have to, Jeremy, but I'm happy to cover it, I guess. Um <laughs> Yeah, so these these pictures you see here on the right are pictures that I took myself. Um, planted April 27th. This was uh, taken about 10 days ago. So as you can see, we're not quite at full dent, but we're we're pretty close to it on those ears. And, and the, the development of those ears, I mean, is great. Those were some really nice looking uh, looking ears. This was over near Guthrie County, Audubon County. Um, but Jeremy, if you want to go ahead and click next, um, I went in and, and started pulling. Some of the GDU numbers for some of these hybrids, and and if you if you punch in a planting date, um, and this tool uh, is a really really neat one that kind of allows you to track out when silking should be, when your earliest black layer date is, when you might have your first freeze. Um, and what I was finding, if you if you look up how many GDUs it takes to get to um, that dense stage, according to places like Iowa State or Illinois, it's around. 2300 maybe 2250 for about 113 day product um and when i when i went back and compared the that number to the iowa state number for that area for for you know guthrie county to the, the numbers from climate field view i was finding that we'd accumulated about 2200 gdus so um you, you backtrack do some math on a hot summer day we can accumulate maybe 18 to 22 gdus so that that tells me we're almost tracking two to three weeks ahead of where we should be from a denting perspective um that's certainly not not necessarily a good thing jeremy do you want to go to the next slide you bet so while i'm talking about denting i just kind of wanted to, to, to talk through this you know what kind of what's the difference and what does it mean so when we're at dough dough is pretty easy to determine right when we're at um, the milk stage, we've got a lot of that milky fluid that's still inside the kernels. Um, and when we've got dough, that kernel is filled with a more, a more starchy consistency. And it starts to look more, more like what you're going to see from a final kernel perspective. And dough occurs about 25 days after silking. Um, we have not accumulated much dry matter. About a third is all that we've picked up. Um, the issue is that when we, you know, when we dent prematurely, as you look at that that R5, it occurs a month after soaking, a little bit more, and usually when everything is full dent, right, every kernel's dented um, and it's a hard dent, we are about a month from black layer, 30 days. So as you think about where I was finding some of this premature dent here already 10 days ago, um, a month out from there, we're looking at black layer dates of the, the 5th of September through the 10th, and that's for 113-day product in 213.93, which is, is actually maybe even a little bit more full season. So as you start to think about what about earlier season products, uh, that, in my opinion, probably moves that black uh, layer date up a lot farther than we're wanting it to. Um, and the issue that I guess I'm seeing is when we hit that full dent, we've picked up about half of the dry matter that that ear is going to accumulate. So we can't, we can't go back, right? We've already, we've already packed that much starch in. Um, so now we've got uh, about a, a week goes by, then that milk line starts to move. That takes about three weeks. So um, now we're starting to look at kernel weight being affected. Um, test weight is something I've been asked about a lot the last week. 
uh, certainly kernel depth. The thing that I that I don't know, I would assume with it being sped up that much, we've probably lost some yield potential. I, I mean, if I had to guess, Jeremy, just the way my brain works, it tells me um, for those 200 GDUs, maybe 10%. That That's just a guess. I don't know that there's any way to know that until after the season. But um, my question is whether or not this dent period can be extended. There have been years that Iowa State's recorded where where it did last. Grainfield lasted a few weeks longer when we had an Indian summer. We had uh, extended warm warm weather, but it wasn't super hot. We got timely rainfall. Um, so it is possible that we can continue to add weight and, and deepen those kernels. But it's in my opinion, it's going to take a change of weather, which I think we're going to see cooler temperatures going forward and certainly much lower overnight temperatures. But I would think a little rain is going to be needed uh, to keep those kernels from ending up shallow. I'm with you, Matt. I think we're in that same boat. And really, to me, it comes down to moisture availability. I mean, we, if you look at the drought monitor and the new one came out this morning, but I haven't had a chance to take a peek at it. You know, I can imagine, uh, you know, we're, we're obviously um, not adding moisture at this point uh, from a precipitation standpoint. So I do think Kernels will be probably a little lighter this year. You know, pollination issues, we've seen some tip back in a lot of fields, um, not, not really a variety dependent. It just depends on where you were at, how hot it was during pollination. Um, so, yeah, there, there's a lot of factors going on right now. I still think there's potential uh, to add some kernel weight there, but it's going to take a lot of key factors coming together with, you know, cooler temperatures coming uh, cooler overnight temperatures, that certainly helps, but we really need some moisture in order for plants to really start, you know, pulling that moisture from the soil versus starting to rob from the stalks. Cause then we start worried about standability issues and, yes. and those types of things. So one thing, one thing uh, I wanted to speak to as well is just Jeremy, you've probably gotten this question too, is what do these plants look like when they're dented three weeks earlier? Um, when Jeremy, I'll take your feedback here too, or from anybody in the chat, if you want to pop in a message from what I have seen, these plants are not fired up. They're not losing lower leaves. They're not rolled during the day. They appear to have a nice green color. The The plants don't look overly stressed yet. We're seeing this dent that has set in so much earlier. Um, and I, that's probably been the most confusing thing about it is it's not like everything is burning up, you know, in the, in the lighter spots, obviously it is, it's it tends to get really bad as you head east towards Cedar Rapids, but for the most part, these plants still look healthy. So the thing I would look for is where you, when you see that premature dent, if your husk is still green and you're not noticeably fired on the lower five leaves, you probably still stand a, a good chance to continue to develop those kernels. If you're seeing some brown husks um, and a lot of firing, then that's maybe a different story. I would agree, Matt. Yep. Anybody have any questions on uh, premature dent and corn or have any uh, observations they'd like to share? Yeah, for those of on the those on the call, just you can chat your questions right in, and we'll be able to we'll be able to see them. If not, Jeremy, I think you're good to 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 move right along. All right, we'll move on. We'll start talking about corn rootworms. Uh, depending on where you're at in our part of the area, corn rootworms have either been uh, a major nuisance or you haven't seen a whole lot going on. But for the most part, I can say at least in the northern half of my territory, which would you know be east central Iowa, kind of into the nose there. Corn rootworms have definitely been a problem. Matt, I know you've had some some issues in your area too. And, you know, we kind of expected that just based on the warmer winters that we had. Uh, we had a great uh, set of spring conditions for the hatch to come through and we're seeing some some major problems flare up. So um, as agronomists, we've been out checking into issues where some traits have not been able to hold back. Um, I threw this picture in this morning. My FSR, uh, Jeff, who is on the call here, sent a short video of uh, some corn rootworms that were actually on a field edge. And, th and you can see we're not even into corn here, but, uh, you know, we're in we're in a set of, uh, you know, like a weed patch here. And just by looking at that, how many corn rootworms do you think you see? And it's really, once I started looking into it, this is just a snap from the video and I'll just go ahead and advance it. I counted 21 and I'm already seeing a couple other ones that I missed. And that was just in a short, just grassy patch next to a field, uh, next to a plot in Clinton County. So, you know, obviously we're, we're done with pollination and corn, corn rootworms still have to eat. So now we're heading to the pollen of uh, our wet ragweeds, water hemp, those types of things. And they are thick in places. So we still have an issue with corn rootworms out there. Uh, still feeding, still um, 
laying eggs and, and such. So something we need to pay attention to. If you're not following this, uh, this insect alert here, if you go to insectforecast.com, you can enter in your email address uh, and this will give you all types of insect alerts. Uh, you can see the map there for high risk for corn root worm. This is from the 13th, but uh, I, I got an update yesterday. The map was still the same, so I just left this picture in here. But you can see that basically the entire Midwest is really thick with corn root worm out there. So it's something we really need to pay attention to. Now, as technical agronomists, we got lucky. Um, in January, the Chinese government approved Smart Stacks Pro, which will be our new corn rootworm trait coming forward. This will add a third mode of action for corn rootworm protection below ground. And we were able to get some plot seed and put some of our own demonstration plots out there. Now, this just happens to be one from Buchanan County. Um, Catherine Rod, our, our technical agronomist in north central and northeast Iowa, uh, took this picture for us just shortly after a storm went through on July 15th. So we put all of the, the rootworm traits out there, ours versus competitors as well, and some wind came through. And you can see Smart Stacks Pro and even Smart Stacks itself holding better, uh, holding itself together much better than uh, our competitors trace that's out there. So this is just a close up view of, you know, our competitors trait Chrome versus our Smart Stacks Pro. Um, much happier to be the person with Smart Stacks Pro on the right versus Chrome on the left. And then it comes down to scoring these roots, right? So node injury scores uh, range from zero to three. And you can see the scores there. Obviously, the lower the number, the better the score is. Now, we do get a lot of questions now and again about scoring roots. And just so you guys are aware of it, if you see any injury out there or just are curious if you have corn rootworm in an issue or in a field that's an issue, um, where we score these roots, we actually look at nodes four, five, and six. So you can see uh, where those are based on this little map here. And if you think about it this way, just from a uh, root physiology standpoint, that little triangle, if you split a corn stalk in half, there's a little triangle down at the bottom that you see. And that's basically basically a compaction of, of nodes one through four. So then you have five and six, obviously, above that. But that's what we're looking at scoring is those particular root nodes uh, for corn rootworm. So we count around, and uh, basically we have a, a set of instructions for scoring roots. If one complete node is gone, uh, that score is a one. You know, So, I mean, it's just a percentage of each one of those three nodes added up together, and uh, one is, is pretty bad. We'd like to see less than 0.5 on a score. Um, and above that is obviously worse and we worry about standability issues. So Matt, this is a picture you took on the right hand side there of a plot. Do you have anything you want to add on that particular uh, plot where you were at? Yeah, this was a, a fun one, Jeremy, one that I visited in mid-July and found very few larvae, um, very few adults, really no pressure. Um, came back last week and it was a different story. There had been just some light wind that had gone through and um, as, as I was walking through the, the plot, I noticed the, you know, the, the non-traded, the double pro with no below ground protection was pretty severely lodged and it was pretty severely fed on. As you can see, it scored about a 2.2. Um, the lodging was pretty variable. It, it somewhat depended on, on the actual hybrid because that also does affect regrowth and the amount of root mass that was there, uh, to begin with. But you can see the difference in, in the scores there in the feeding, um, Smart Stacks Pro was what really stood out to me. There was there was very little lodging in it. You could see where there had been feeding, but they had not clipped much off of those roots. Uh, as you can see from those pictures, really nice, large, healthy root masses. Um, I think one one thing that's I stood out to me here, Jeremy, and we've been seeing this was the the effectiveness of an above ground trait plus a, a soil applied insecticide. In this case, a dry. Um, from what we've seen across the seven TAs in the state this year, the liquid systems did not work very well. And in some cases, the dries didn't either due to, you know, the, the, the dry conditions that we had. But as an option, if you're trying to break up a rotation and you, and you really don't want to rotate to soybeans, which is what we always ultimately recommend as the most effective option, we have seen some of those in, uh, soil applied insecticides work uh, fairly well. Uh, in, and that's what I saw in this plot. Yep. Now, same thing here, Matt, on the east side of the state. I think the liquid control options for soil applied insecticide this year struggled to to be effective especially where moisture was lacking um, so just another one of those challenges we have to face when trying to battle corn rootworm uh, so just to give you guys a little bit of an update um, where we at where we are at with smart stacks pro um, all of us iowa tas were invited a couple of weeks ago in fact it was august 10th we got to go to a plot near grand junction iowa 
where all of the new SmartStacks Pro uh, PCM3s and PCM4s are uh, being evaluated in advance. So uh, pre-commercial lines that are, uh, we, we have the chance to uh, latch onto a couple of these for sale this year, for planting next year. Um, and then PCM3 status, they'll be ones that will be offered to us this fall. And then we'll get into plots in 2022 for uh, sale for 2023. So uh, just, an update there, uh, it was a really eye-opening as far as what we were able to see uh, at this particular plot. This plot was planted on a field that was uh, has been 20 years corn on corn, so the bugs in there, the corn rootworm larvae, and you know have hatched, and the, the adults were were pretty thick uh, until you got out into the field. So it was interesting to see that we were looking at basically the 105 to 110 relative maturity hybrids there. We know that we will have some units available for 2022 um there's a lot of things still in the works so i can't tell you how many units of what particular maturities will be available for sale um that that people can plant in 2022 but uh, it's something that's being worked through now but just know that some options will become available i don't think we were totally expecting the chinese government to approve smart stacks pro so early this year but it gave us an opportunity to to uh, be very agile, I guess, is manipulating uh, production plans and uh, seed availability. So we're working on uh, getting some options out there to you guys in some of those key corn rootworm areas. So again, we're looking at advancements and and just the notes, there were 14 different entries out there. They didn't even have a name yet, but I mean, just some of the scores and agronomics, you know, anywhere twos and threes for Northern Corn Leaf Blight and Great Leaf Spot. Um, some of these have the ASR trade in them for anthracnose stock rot. But I can just tell you, if I were to show you pictures, it would just be pictures of corn. But I mean, the agronomics behind these, the plants were clean, uh, just very uh, durable stalks. They looked fantastic. Some of the ears were were gigantic. So the genetics coming into the pipeline that we're attaching Smart Stacks Pro to are really something to be excited about. And we'll continue to talk about that as we progress. So just some examples here. You know, we've been under a lot of stress and Matt and I have talked about that. And you can see this picture on the right here, you know, where corn is really stressed and we add corn rootworm problems to it. You can see uh, the disadvantage that some of those products have. And SmartStacks Pro has been able to come through. The thing we want to remember as well is that SmartStacks Pro is great. It's the next generation of, of uh traits that's coming down the pipe, but we can't rely on that as a, as a complete silver bullet to help protect us from corn rootworm. Smart Stacks itself is still a reliable option, but we really need to be looking at things uh, from a perspective, kind of like this decision, decision tree here. Um, you know, we, we encourage guys, like Matt said earlier, we really need to get guys to look at um, other management practices and not just relying solely on a trait. So anytime we can get somebody that's in a high corn rootworm pressure situation to rotate through to a, a non-host crop, especially like soybeans, we understand, you know, corn on corn is, is generally in those high cattle feeding areas or dairy areas, those types of things. But we really need to talk guys uh, to to talk to customers and farmers about other management practices. Otherwise, we're just going to burn through both of these traits much faster than uh, than we would like. And we want this technology to be around and to, uh, you know, to ensure some protection. So we just have to be selective on where we go with these traits as they come down the road. So, Matt, let's talk about uh, SDS and soybeans. Again, I don't really want to. I get uh, <clears throat> all the fun topics here this morning, Jeremy. Um, so sudden death syndrome in soybean has been – an issue that I think we've all seen across most parts of Iowa. For me, with the central area that I cover, um, I see less as I go east, uh, but it's certainly still starting to show up on the heavier soils. And, you know, central, west central Iowa seems to be uh, kind of lousy with it at this point. And that's, for those of you unfamiliar with it, these are the, the symptoms on the leaves that we typically see. Um, they, they, there are other, a couple other diseases that can sort of mimic these symptoms, but this is this is pretty typical foliar symptoms of, of sudden death syndrome. Jeremy, you want to go to the next slide? All right, so we're going to do some trivia here. Um, SDS in soybean is a blank infection. Is it a stock infection, a leaf infection, a root infection? Um, does anybody, anybody want to come off mute and answer that question or uh, pop it in the chat? Anybody? Nobody's jumping on, Matt. All right. I think everybody's scared. Jeremy, you want to take this first one? I will. 
In fact, I'll advance the slide just to show it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so SDS is a root infection. A lot of people see the leaf symptomology and go, oh, you know, we have problems with the leaves. But it's actually an infection that, that starts in the roots, and we eventually see a toxin pull in from the roots and get established in the leaves, and that's why we see the yellowing uh, in between the veins on soybean roots. But usually in years where there's enough moisture, you'll see this blue fungi down at the bottom right uh, usually slightly below the, the uh, soil surface there. And that's the, the actual fungi that causes the root infection and uh, gives us a symptomology in SDS. All right, SDS infection. Does it typically happen early in the season or late in the growing season? Any, uh, anybody have any, any guesses? I know we're seeing the symptoms now, so does anybody... Um, anybody have any thoughts on when it actually uh, comes in and infects? It's a 50-50 shot, early or late. Happens early. There it is. Good answer. Um, root infection in soybean does happen early. It uh, can happen right after planting. It can happen uh, in, the, in the early vegetative stages. Uh, it's, it's often made worse by cool, wet conditions, soil compaction, um, SCN pressure, uh, all of these things, especially SCN uh, feeding. They can actually uh, cause wounds in those roots and, and uh, create entry points for this disease to get into the soybean plant. A lot of times uh, we see uh, infection set in, in those early vegetative stages, think emergence through uh, maybe V2 or, or V3. So that's, that's when the infection, the fusarium pathogen, actually gets into the soybean plants. Okay, number three, sudden death syndrome is often confused with blank as a disease. I kind of hinted at one of these diseases earlier. Um, anybody have any answers as to what can easily be confused with sudden death syndrome? Bictothera. Bictothera, okay. Any other, any other thoughts? There we go, Jeremy. Thanks for advancing. Um, it's actually often confused with brown stem rot. And this picture on the right, you can see that that looks very similar from a, a foliar injury symptom to sudden death syndrome. They, they're they actually very hard to distinguish out in the field. So the, the easiest way to do that is to split the stems. Um, so as the name implies, brown stem rot is a stem disease. And if plants have it, you'll as you split that stem open, you will see that the pith which is that, that most interior part of the stem will turn brown, as you see in that picture. And the cortex, which is uh, all of the tissue surrounding that center part of the stem, will stay uh, healthy and, and green. With sudden death syndrome, it's the opposite. That, that pith, that center part of the stem, will still be a whitish green color, but the cortex, all that tissue surrounding it, will be a, a brownish color. And it's really noticeable as you get towards the crown of the plant um, to the base of the plant where it meets the ground, that tissue is usually completely brown. Uh, but it's they're very easy to confuse, and without splitting stems, it's kind of hard to tell. Um, and the last one, we typically get sun death syndrome with a blank spring. What what type of spring weather would be conducive to getting this disease? Anyone? I know everybody was thinking it, Matt, so I figured I would advance. That's right. Everyone, everyone knows. All right. So we typically get it with a wet spring. Uh, this this diagram on the right kind of shows how these toxins get into the plant. And, you know, we mentioned it's a root rot, but what, what ends up happening is it infects the root and actually sends toxins that go up into the plant. And those toxins are what turn those leaves, um, those colors. That's that's what ends up happening. Eventually, those leaves will fall off. It kind of looks like a deer has, has kind of fed on those plants once the leaves fall off. So, Jeremy, would you click once? So if it's a wet spring where we get SDS from typically, why are we seeing so much this year? That's a question I've been getting a lot. It did not seem like a good year to get sudden death syndrome. And, and in my opinion, there's a lot of factors at play. Um, the biggest one for me is, um, and, and these are some comments that Darren Mueller from Iowa State has uh, applied as well. And I'll kind of talk about those in a second. But what I think happened was, uh, our soybean plants just kind of stalled out after emergence. And if you uh, think back to what your customers were saying, our farmers, if they were your own beans, think back to how they looked in June. Uh, our soybeans kind of sat in neutral for the entire month, it seemed like, and even some of May. 
um, they were up, but they just weren't growing. Um, go back to what our beans look like, you know, from the middle of May through the middle of June. We just, some of us uh, thought they were never going to grow. They were putting on no height, no new leaves. Um, growth was really slow. And, and around planting time, uh, we had a lot of dry conditions. It was cooler. And we also planted soybeans much earlier than ever before. I, I talked to a lot of farmers who were done with beans by May 1st, which is certainly not typical for most people across the state. So uh, I think those all contributed, but there's certainly some, some more things uh, in play as well. Talking with Darren about um, SDS seed treatments, talking to agronomists across the state, we're all seeing the same thing. Some SDS pressure, regardless of whether or not an SD, uh, you know, an SDS seed treatment like Olivo or Saltro was used. Um, some of the severity does come down to how sensitive certain varieties are. We are certainly seeing weaker products on SDS showing more symptoms, but uh, it is odd to be seeing so much SDS where we know the seed was treated with a, a treatment that should have helped mitigate it. And um, Darren had a couple thoughts on it. He, his, his comments were, you know, in years past, we might still see symptoms where we use a product like Olivo, but in general, when we get to harvest, we've seen a noticeable yield difference because even with the SDS pressure, that seed treatment still did do something. Um, so we're wondering if that's going to be the case again this year. We've got some trials where we've got treated versus untreated, so that will sort of give us an answer. But we're a little concerned um, if the treatments actually worked, uh, and that was his question, right? Are they working? Uh, in dry conditions, those uh, you know those seed treatments may not get the water that they need um, to start to take effect. You know, a uh, product like Saltro is not very water soluble, but Olivo certainly is. We know it got into the plant because we did see a lot of that, uh, a lot of those those flashing on the cotyledons like we normally see. But w we're wondering if the dry conditions didn't render those seed treatments maybe a little bit less effective this year. Um, we've also seen some symptoms that are not typical of sudden death syndrome. So for those of you who have noticed some yellow out in your fields, but not seeing these these typical symptoms, right, where you have the yellow and then the necrosis and the leaves fall off, we're not really seeing that as much this year. And as far as we can figure out, we did not get the the toxins in the leaves, but we got the root rot instead, which is, again, kind of a unique thing. It's not something that we've seen frequently where we have SDS, but really only the root has been affected. Um, so these are all kind of new symptoms for us. Iowa State is in the same, the same place as us trying to figure out why we've seen um, – SDS pressure when we didn't expect it and why we've seen different symptoms than we've really ever seen in the past. So um, stay tuned on this. We're still doing a lot of work and, and research to try to figure out why we've seen some of these oddities this year. But um, it's certainly been there's certainly been SDS pressure as you, as you get out and, and look at soybean fields across the region. Yeah, so I would encourage everybody, you know, things are starting to turn and uh, it's a good time to be out checking fields out and just making sure that uh, we're not running into that. And I would also encourage you, even on later planted fields, uh, one of the, the pictures that I had earlier on uh, was some SDS symptomology that was looking over an entire field. That field was planted mid-May. So, you know, we would think that we would be out of a, uh, a cool soil type or wet condition scenario there, uh, and we were still seeing SDS symptomology out there. So it's a good time to get out there, check things out, and just uh, plan ahead. So the last topic we wanted to cover with you guys was just hit on uh, some product spotlights. So look at some of the uh, key relative maturity products, the higher volume products that we have in corn and go through just some of the key highlights of these products. Look at some of the pictures of what we've seen so far and uh, just get uh, get a look at what we're seeing out in the field right now. So the first one I want to talk about is that 20570 family. So these were new. The, the stacks came out last year. We had the stacks and plots and uh we had a little bit of the Tricepta out there. We have the Tricepta and Stacks out in full sets of plots this year. And uh, everything looks really nice right now. Considering some of the conditions we've been under uh, for the early relative maturity stuff, this product is looking good both in the Stacks and in the Tricepta. So we think of the Stacks as more of that stable performer that's across variable acres. Uh, if you want the yield pig, the one that I call the yield pig, that would be the Tricepta. There's a lot more yield potential there. So I would target more productive areas for that one to try and get more maximum performance potential out of that. Uh, we saw great early season vigor. These products have strong stocks, um, good tolerance to green snap. They look really healthy right now, um, even without a fungicide application. So that's one of the good points of these products. So if you're looking for on the early side, that 105-day uh, product, that really just looks healthy and has a couple of options there in different trait packages and yield potential as well. 
um, that's where 205, the 20570 family comes in there. There's a little bit of flex to it, but mostly that mid 30s for uh, 30,000s for population seems to handle it well. And we've got some good pra- packages uh, or good package of products on both the early and the, the fuller season side of this product to really make a good one two punch with this particular product out in the country. Matt, what have you seen on 20906? Yeah, I've really liked the, the looks of this product. Uh, 2906 is not, not a new product. We, we had it uh, in the lineup last year as well. Um, this is kind of more of a, 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 a prefers high management, prefers a little bit better ground type product. But what we've seen this year is that the stress tolerance is maybe better than we gave it credit for. And that's something we've really been on the hunt for as agronomists. It's a good year to try to evaluate that. Um, you can see from the, the pictures here from some of our plots that the tip back has been pretty minimal. Uh, it, uh, it's actually flexed a little bit as well, where we, we put it at lower populations. Um, this product, if there's a, a field with, with uh, high fertility and we're using a fungicide, this is going to be one of my go-tos. But again, I've been encouraged by um, some of the, the drought tolerance I've seen from it this year. Um, so really, really happy with this product. We think it's it's going to be versatile for us. We, we knew that it yielded last year. I, I think the one the one watch out we've seen is its roots are a little slow to develop from a brace root perspective. So we saw some lodging from it in the early July storms. Uh, we have not seen any from the late wind storms. The roots have really uh, gone down and explored more soil. So just kind of a, a slow brace root developer early in the season. But uh, in all, we're, we're really happy with the agronomics of it. It's, um, its disease traits are good and it's more of a, a fungicide for a yield from a yield perspective type type of product. So uh, we're, I think we're going to do some heavy lifting with it this fall once we get the combine into it and uh i'm excited to see the results hey, hey matt and jeremy this is uh this is jeff aper i i would agree with the all the comments on two is uh do you think we should kind of place or tell our customers to uh try to plant this one a little earlier with the with the roots getting down a little later do you think yeah. that might be that's a great a great call out, jeff i so I would agree that that absolutely will help its root development. And when you think about an emergent standpoint, we didn't put this on here, Jeff, but this was uh, one of the one of the shining stars from, the, from an early season emergence perspective. It was very uniform. Um, some of our plots got planted really early, and this was one of the first out of the ground um, and also carried really even um, stands as well. So I think that factor does make it a great one to go out and run early. I would agree with you on that. Matt, any other questions or we'll move on. All right, next one on the list, an oldie but a goodie, 21079 and that family there. Obviously, our biggest focus uh, as a team is probably on the Drought Guard Double Pro. Great st- stress tolerance, and we've had a couple of uh, late summer dry spells and uh, or an entire summer dry spell this year. But, uh, you know, as far as stress tolerance, 21079 seems to be the go-to for handling all of that. Works well across a lot of different soil types. Uh, kind of a semi-flex hybrid as well, so we don't have to push those populations very hefty uh, to, to really get this thing to max out in yield potential. Great dry down, so you know, if you've got a guy that really wants to get out there, get something in the ground and harvest it early, this makes a perfect option for that. The only concern or caution that we have around 21079 would be in the fall. With some of the wide ranges of stress that we have, you know, crown rot can be an issue with 21079. So that's why we just encourage you guys to remind customers that if they they need a product to harvest early, this is the one that they would want to get on the list uh, towards the top there. We don't want to let that thing sit out very long, but the yield potential is fantastic. As you can see, what Matt and I have seen out in the field so far, very little tip back, just great grain quality with it so far great kernel fill and uh, things look really good for 21079. So, you know, that's that's one of our, our big volume products. It makes sense to package that or even lead to package with that in the 110 relative maturity range in the range. And there's a lot of products to go with that, which you can see below there. So 21079, just another good one to have uh, in the back pocket. And uh, it, it's a great stress product. And we're seeing that again this year. Yeah, as I described that one, Jeremy, it's a grower and a dyer. It wants to put everything it's got into that ear. <laughs> Perfect. Yep, exactly. Okay. Um, last two products we wanted to hit on would be uh, what we, we're calling the Bash Brothers at 114. So 214, 22 Smart Stacks and 21478 Drought Guard Double Pro. As you can see, different base genetics for these two products, but uh, we're seeing things that we really like from, from each one of them, and they're, they're really similar in a lot of ways. So 
Starting out with 214.22, this is the, the versatile every acre type product. It's got the agronomics uh, across a host of characteristics that we want um, to handle everything from the heaviest soils to the lightest soils. And we've seen that play out in its performance um, and the way that it looks this year as well. Um, it, it, it's a semi-flex, so we've got some flexibility on population. Uh, I like to keep it in that 33 to 35 range is where I, you know, I think 34 is a good target for it. Um, another great thing about this one is it's late harvest standability. This is one that you pick, you pick when you want to. Um, it's, it's not going to be one that, that has issues with premature death, uh, on most soils. And it's going to be one that you can, you can, uh, have a little confidence in, um, when you go and prioritize which fields you want to, to harvest first. Um, and it doesn't dry down super, super wet either for 114 days. So we really like that from it. Again, just very, very versatile, very dependable, um, with that, that yield performance that I think you're really going to like. And then uh, there's 214.78, which is kind of a different type of product. It's it's really tall, um, but it, it's, it's got a lot of things going for it. Um, really strong roots. For a tall plant, as aggressive of brace roots as I've seen on a hybrid, uh, just a really solid, huge root mass, uh, which is which is really important, for, for, for my, in my opinion, when you talk about a, a bigger plant that's got more leaves to keep the factory going. Um, this one we think is is more determinate, but possibly has a little bit of ear flex. So kind of in that same population range as, as 214.22. What we really like from this one is is the stress tolerance. That that drought guard double pro trait, uh, that biotech trait for stress tolerance and, and water u utilization um, is one was one uh, factor. But we've just seen really really healthy uh, stalks and leaves on the lightest soil types uh, in the driest parts of the state from this product. And year over year, that's what we've seen. Um, and uh, when it comes to yield, this is this is the monster. It's 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 an absolute horse from a yield perspective, um, and that's really what what where we're going to position it as. We know it's got stress tolerance, but um, if you're if you're seeking those those really high yield uh, yield numbers, regardless of where you're at in the state, this is going to be the product for it. Uh, it's also got really good dry down. Again, it's 114 day, but we don't see it uh, behaving super wet. Um, it's really pretty true to relative maturity there. And, uh, I think with the with the, the population you can plant it with, this is a great pair with 213.19. Um, I think those two will play really well together. Um, last year in plots, 214.78 was uh, just far and away the best product we, we planted in the southern half of the state for sure, and it performed well in the northern half as well. And uh, from what I've seen, I'm expecting it to, to look the same this fall. I agree with you totally, Matt. And, you know, these products really stick out in plots, too. We were down by Mount Pleasant yesterday with the uh, Southeast Iowa team looking at these and just fantastic kernels. You know, the kernel fill was great. The stress tolerance was great. They haven't had a lot of rain down that way for a while. Uh, so things are starting to dry out. 214.22 stands out from a plant health, health perspective. If you can get up and above a crop and take a look, this thing will be the greenest thing you'll see. And uh, the the drought guard or the stress tolerance with the drought guard gene from 214.78 just really gives that, um, you know, all of the, the potential that it needs. And we saw that last year being super hot and super dry in August. Both of these products did well in plots. And, you know, for, for the first time out, sometimes we have a little bit of, you know, we want to walk before we run with some of these things. But uh, these things ab obviously rose to the top and they're they're looking to do it again this year. So. So, guys, that's what we had for Matt Miner in the morning today. We hope you guys got something out of this. If you have any questions, please go ahead and throw them in the chat. We will uh, go ahead and answer them. Uh, if you have anything that you want to just come off mute and ask right now, we'll certainly stick around and answer them. We want to appreciate you guys, uh, just tell you that we appreciate you guys joining on. We've got a lot of good uh, participants today. The numbers are creeping up. We really appreciate that and appreciate your time. Like I said, if you have any questions for us, by all means, let us know now. We'll uh, we'll take a look at the chat later on, too, and get those answered for you. But really appreciate your time today. Hope you guys got something out of it. And stay tuned. We'll be uh, announcing the next session of Matt Meyer in the morning here coming up. Thanks for your time, everybody. Thanks, everybody.